Okay, so uh, the topic for today, we are starting uh, in the next chapter about uh, um, basically de design principles uh, and guidelines. Uh, we'll focus mostly on, on the principles uh, that are uh, of, uh, uh, on, on let's say, intermediate uh, abstraction level. And uh, uh, concerning the guidelines, we will uh, say, see some, some more, something more when we'll deal about uh, uh, visual design later on. Um, just to, again, to show the, the map, uh, the map of uh, where we are, okay? Um, we are at this stage uh, um, seeking for some uh, guidance uh, in the design of our application. So up to now, for example, last week, uh, or um, we, we discussed about uh, paper, paper prototypes, and we said, we should try to generate uh, one or more alternatives in order to be able to test them. But do we have any rules uh, that uh, will help us, uh, in, uh, will guide us in thinking and designing these uh, different alternatives? Hmm? Uh, it turns out that there are no strict rules. Uh, no? It's not <laughs> like a programming language where you have a syntax that you must adhere to that. Uh, but of course, there are uh, guidelines, there are principles that we have to follow. And this uh, uh, will be used both during uh, generation of the, uh, of the interface, uh, the experimentation, and also during evaluation. So if we have some rules, so we try to follow these rules uh, while creating or thinking um, the interface, and also while uh, testing and evaluating whether a given interface, uh, the result of our work, uh, uh, complies or not uh, with these guidelines uh, or what are the criticalities, okay? Uh, for evaluation, we'll uh, apply of both the general principles that we are starting to see today and the more specific rules uh, um, when we deal about with, with the heuristic evaluation, uh, uh, a, a more practical set of rules. So basically, both for generating design solution and for evaluating our designs, uh, we are trying to think about uh, some say, more practical uh, uh, rules uh, or, or principles. Uh, basically, in the literature, you find uh, different types or different levels uh, of guidance or suggestions uh, about these uh, steps. Uh, they uh, may be called theories or principles or guidelines. Uh, basically, the difference uh, is the abstraction level where theories are more general and uh, so they apply, you know, like, for example, the Norman theory of interaction. Now we have the gulf evaluation, gulf of um, execution. Yeah, it's, uh, it's important to understand this mechanism, but that it doesn't give us any, let's say, immediate uh, uh, operational uh, information. So once that they know there is this gulf, I, I want to make it uh, uh, more narrow, but how to do that, okay? So theories gives us the framework to think about interaction. Uh, principles uh, are general strategies, uh, general rules, general principles where we start turning, uh, let's say, the psychology and the behavior of the humans into some uh, property or characteristic of the interface. Uh, for example, we'll uh, speak a lot today and in the next weeks about consistency. Okay, our mind express some consistency in the behavior, and so this will be a rule that we'll try to apply to the interface elements, to the layout, to the colors, to the fonts, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, so there are some principles that can uh, be used to turn, uh, let's say, uh, human behavior principles into general design rules. I say, I say in general because principles tend to be applicable to a different uh, range of technologies. So general principles applies both to a mobile interface and a web interface and desktop interface, um, and a kiosk, uh, an embedded device or whatever, okay? So, uh, of course, uh, uh, this principle we need to be turned into concrete, uh, say, widget uh, or layouts uh, or interfaces, and uh, at this point we get uh, and specific uh, to a each and every technology. So it's good to say every design should be consistent, right? And we, we can uh, say argumentate and uh, argue about what this means, uh, but then we want to create a website, and then we want to create a, a mobile application. And uh, so there we may have uh, oh, uh, maybe some toolkits already available 
for ensuring this kind of consistency. Maybe not that the toolkits may be code already, maybe libraries already, or maybe just books uh, where you have a set of rules that you have to follow and recommendations and so on. At this stage, we are talking about guidelines uh, where you have a set of, let's say, uh, prescriptive instruction. What to do, how to, how to do it. Uh, I don't know, just an example of the guidelines is the um, uh, material design guidelines by the Google, okay? So there are guidelines that tell you, okay, if you are creating uh, a, a mobile application in the modern version of Android, you should make buttons like this, you should make ma uh, menus in this way, you should make uh, uh, dialogues in, the way, in this way and so on. And they give you detailed instructions about that. Instructions, but also resources, libraries, uh, examples, code, and so on. So uh, guidelines are in a way one possible embodiment uh, of uh, the accepted principle into a specific technology, into a specific branding, into a specific, uh, um, let's say, domain, no? uh, device domain and application domain. So this, we have this spectrum, let's say, of, uh, of uh, information. Uh, I'm going to skip about uh, the, the theories uh, um, because basically they are more about uh, you know, the, the how the humans think. Uh, we already um, discussed in the first uh, week uh, the Norman's model, and there are several other uh, theories, uh, but we, we are not going to, uh, at this stage in the course, spend time in discussing them. Uh, I will go directly to discussing the principles of the design. Mm -hmm. So while the, let me go just back, just back to the title, the design theories help us understanding the why, okay? Why <laughs> means, uh, why is the human behaving this way? Uh, why do we need to be careful about, uh, I don't know, color contrast? That's because the human vision of the system, and so the human uh, system, the vision system, yes, behaves in a given way. And design principles tell me the what, okay? What are the things that we, I need to be careful? And guidelines will, will, will tell me the how, actually, so practical instructions. Hmm? Um, design principle. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, uh, are more widely applicable, are more, let's say, enduring. They, they, we don't discover new principles every week uh, or every year, while maybe new design toolkits uh, or new uh, design conventions uh, are created. Um, so every couple of years, you know, the, the big names uh, are trying to change uh, the look. Uh, uh, I don't know, for example, the, the guidelines for Windows 11 applications are different from those from Windows 10, also for branding, but also for, uh, say, following the trends and uh, discovering new and better ways of doing things, okay? So guide, specific guidelines tend to change quite frequently, let's say once a year or so, or so while the, um, so the, the, just the general evolution of interfaces but they mostly tend to apply the same principles, okay? Um, uh, these principles uh, actually depend uh, on, on the interaction size that the user uh, uh, adopts. So we want to, let's say, um, customize uh, the, the behavior according to the type of interaction. So maybe a, a window-driven interaction, maybe a, a console-driven interaction, and so on. And so, of course, uh, different principles apply huh, to the different modalities. And we'll see uh, today uh, basically these eight uh, golden rules uh, of interaction design. Uh, about uh, the interaction styles, uh, today hmm, we have uh, uh, basically these five uh, big, uh, uh, let's say, approaches to interaction, okay? Um, Direct manipulation is when, let's say, imagine a graphical user interface with drag and drop capability where it's clicking and modifying properties and so on. Uh, so we have objects on the screen and we, uh, the user tries to manipulate these objects. How does he manipulate them? With fingers, with the mouse, uh, it's, it's, it's a separate issue, it's a more device issue. But the metaphor is you have some objects on your visual space whether it's a screen or a virtual reality helmet, 
and you manipulate the, directly this object. And the manipulation of these virtual objects uh, with these metaphors uh, correspond to giving some instructions to the system. Or you can have a, a menu-driven interaction. Huh? Many websites are organized in this way. You have one first level menu, second level menu, different sections and so on, and you navigate through them. Many desktop applications have a menu system. Hmm? Menus can be textual menus, maybe icon bars and so on. So you select comments by giving explicit comments, uh, taking from a palette of possible comments. And these are listed somewhere, let's say, around <laughs> the main interface. You may go into an interaction modality of filling forms. So, um, so instead of, uh, let's say, drag and drop a file to copy it, uh, you may have a copy window where you, s where you select uh, the name of the file and the destination where to copy it, for example. Uh, uh, it seems old, uh, we don't like it very much, it's not modern, but it's a possibility. In, in many cases, uh, we, we resort to form filling uh, when there is no better or uh, easily acceptable or easily understandable metaphor, okay? So we don't do that uh, uh, for, there's no direct manipulation interface for entering your, your name, for example. Hmm? Um, or we can resort, uh, Nowadays, it's quite seldom, but as a programmer, we do that to command languages, so entering comments. Uh, you know, the, the command line, uh, we use it uh, when we work uh, at the system, system, system administration level uh, or when developing, but uh, think about all the chat box that are around there. So again, it's, uh, it's the command language uh, coming back again in the form of uh, slash comments that you're giving to the bot for executing some information. So it's a, it's a, a format, a form of interaction, okay, um, that today is built into many chat systems. Or we may strive for natural language, uh, so you can talk to your car or to your voice assistant. Uh, it doesn't really understand natural language. It, it will understand some keywords, uh, and you can pretend yourself that it's understanding more than it actually does. So these are, it, we can imagine that a system is made of a combination, normally, of these uh, uh, different interaction modalities. It's a mixture of different parts that will follow different modalities. But more or less, if you take into account all of these, they cover all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, we have a lot of details for each of them. But each of these domains have the rules. Mm -hmm. um, okay. About uh, the taking from, uh, um, say, Norman's uh, uh, theory, uh, we have some principles that Norman already mentioned, and uh, we will, uh, say, uh, see a mu much more concrete, uh, say, definition of this, uh, uh, of this principle when we deal about uh, um, uh, heuristic uh, evaluation. Uh, but basically, for the, the consequence of the normal model, normal, sorry, model, uh, is that uh, it's very important uh, to keep uh, a good visibility of the state of the system. Uh, there should be a good conceptual model. And this is also especially dif difficult when your system is evolving. So you are adding features as you go, and so you are, in a way, polluting your conceptual model. You start with a very, very clean idea, very clean conceptual model, and then you can start adding features here and there and there. So it doesn't look at, like a tree anymore. It will look like a, you know, a, a, a messy forest or whatever. Uh, and so this creates, of course, uh, um, difficulty in the users, especially those users who didn't follow the development of the system. So if you see the feature appearing one by one, you can, in a way, rationalize them. If you are, are new to the application, you cannot make uh, um, your, your mind about uh, how it should work. And, uh, uh, okay, basically this visibility and this conceptual model will turn into having good mappings between what is on the screen and the what is on the interface and what are its meaning, their meaning and their uh, actions. And users should continue to be in the feedback loop, so always. 
And at the same time, the other big, uh, uh, let's say, learning principle from Norman's model is that uh, failures and errors and problems are a part of the interaction, are a big part of the interaction. Mm? So we should always think how we handle those uh, as a priority, not just, okay, let's add some validation later on. Okay. Um, and we must be able to study which kind of errors uh, the users tend to do and try to prevent them or and uh, help them correcting them if they fall into those uh, uh, errors. Okay, I, as I say, these general principles will turn into very practical rules uh, uh, in, a, in a basically two weeks or one and a half weeks. Um, one in the literature, we find also these uh, sort of eight uh, golden rules of interface designs. They are called golden rules. They fall into what we call the principles. Okay, they are already practical. We can check whether they are satisfied or not. Uh, of course, they are not uh, at the level of guidelines, uh, so they don't apply a, to a specific technology. They apply to basically all of them. So let's say, let's comment, uh, say them one by one. The first one, I think is my favorite also, is uh, striving for consistency. Mm. This means that uh, similar situations should, should lead uh, to similar sequences of actions. Mm. So uh, what, what similar means it depends on, on, on us, but we don't expect uh, you know, signing up for an event uh, to be totally different from uh, signing up uh, for uh, maybe a seminar or whatever. Hmm? Uh, the, the, the sequence of actions should be similar if the final goal is in the mind of the user can be considered similar. The same terminology in the menus, so be consistent. If you are using a term, always use it consistently. Have a glossary uh, when you are developing so that uh, you, you are sure that you are using consistently your terms. Uh, colors. Same color means same functionality, different colors means different functionalities, and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, the same for layout, for size, uh, for fonts. Uh. So every time a user feels a homogeneous structure in the interface, it will think about similar or corresponding concepts. You remember? the visibility of the system status. So I imagine that the system will tell me that these two are the same, are of the same category. Every time the user sees some difference, it will infer that difference in the, in the interface, it will deduce wrongly or rightly that uh, these actions or this portion mean different things, are of different natures, okay? So we try to exploit it, we should exploit it and, and then don't uh, let's say, trick the user into thinking differently. Mm. There may be exceptions to these rules, exactly for the reason uh, when, uh, that we want to highlight that something is actually different. Uh, for example, a, a dangerous action, if you have a, a, a long list of actions with a, in a menu system or, or in a form system, if there is some dangerous ac action, it's better if that is comes in a different color or, or in different style. So that the user mind is prompted to say, okay, what is different with this? Ah, okay, it's dangerous. So I'm attracting attention. Of course, it, I can be attracting attention to one or two items, not to 17 of them, okay? So let's not make a mess of a lot of differences, okay? But just highlight the good ones. Uh, some examples. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, the, the machines that you use to load your uh, um, um, bus uh, uh, tickets uh, or uh, monthly, let's say, uh, I don't know, the world. Okay. Uh, but uh, have a look at, the, now, now they are different, they are a bit different, uh, so may, maybe they are different, a bit worse. But uh, at this stage, uh, I have uh, some instructions it says, that, okay, for re recharging your ticket, uh, you must uh, press the key called Ritarica, okay? 
and in the screen there is no key called ricarica because it's called attiva titolo okay and uh, for get information by the way the, the get information is uh, should you should select info titolo but of course uh, the name here is info which is different okay so at the first sight you you're already, okay, uh, I need to press this button. Where is it here? Only after a while, by trial and error, okay, let's try this, okay. So we had people who really spent some time, developers, in writing these strings. We had people that create this layout, this graphical, let's say, panel. They just didn't talk to each other. Um, there are other errors here, for example, like uh, this information, this box uh, is about getting information, but uh, visually is contained under the Ricarica heading. So it looks, from first sight, if you don't, if you don't read, okay, so it's better for those of you who don't, who don't, or don't understand Italian, you see that it, there's a heading here with two alternatives. So you assume that these two alternatives are part of, two parts of this heading. Actually, the information is not part of recharging. There is some information on the left, which is worsening because uh, it talks ag again about a, a key called Ricarica which doesn't exist. And this information is identical to this one the bottom but my mind is thinking but if there is if there are two boxes in two different places with different colors I'm playing the find the difference game right so what, what what's the difference are they saying the same thing or not it turns out they are probably letter by letter but it takes a while to figure that out if there are two they, sh they should tell different things. If they look too similar, I need to find the difference. This is how our mind works. Hmm? Um, we take in Lyft. I, I love Lyft interfaces. Uh, they're a continuous source of... Uh, so a lift goes up and down, right? And so we have a set of buttons that may be on a vertical it's a strip or, or on, a, on a horizontal strip sometimes. Uh, or when space requires, you can pack them into a 2D grid or something like that. Okay, if you are packing them into a 2D grid, uh, we can follow some patterns. So from left to right, from bottom to top. Okay, so five, four, three, two, one, they look uh, okay. And then we have an R and an S and a minus one. <coughs> <clears throat> so, R is probably the ground level in some languages, and S should be below ground, and minus one is also below ground. So, it's something in the layout tells me that minus one is lower than S, probably. But I'm left with a question mark in my mind, not with a certainty. Okay? But it gets worse. This one, uh, this one, I, I, I took it uh, myself in a, in a hotel. Um, not all of them are, are easy to read. Minus one, zero, one, two, three, four, and five. So what do you make of that? Okay, the, the sequence is okay, but the layout, what is this layout trying to tell me? Is it telling me that the, the hotel, you know, what, it's split in two directions, or maybe on this floor, the, the you know, where there are some lifts where you have the front and the back door, and so on some lifts the, or the, the front door opens, and on some others, uh, say, uh, um, you have the back door, you need to uh, go out from the back door. Uh, no. Actually, it was a very normal lift, and uh, for whatever reason, I cannot divine, uh, somebody, design this layout. So it's puzzling at first, but uh, there was no reason I could find. But remember, this is a 
aluminum plate that has been cut precisely with those holes. So there was something which took a piece of somebody, sorry, who took a piece of paper and drew the position of these holes and gave them to the person that was uh, preparing the aluminum plate and cutting with the right holes and so on. So it's deliberate. It doesn't happen by accident. What did they have in mind? I don't know. Hmm? Not consistency, of course. They wanted to try something different, maybe. Don't know. And then there are these. OK, I, I, I cannot find the 1, minus 2, 2, 3, minus 3, minus 4, 4. Uh, 3 is missing, by the, by the way, minus 5, 5, 6. Uh, I, I hope this is a joke, but uh, uh, I will leave it like this. Uh, so, mm. uh, we can, you know, uh, this is an example that we see very often. And a button for, we do, with two positions, on and off. Okay? There is an, in, uh, an ambiguity in all of this. Uh, so can you tell me which one is selected right now? Now or later? Is blue the selected color and white the uh, non-selected color or vice versa? We don't know, okay? If we had another button here, before and after a series of buttons, we could understand it, probably. If we had some label on the side that will tell me, okay, we'll repeat what I'm selecting. Uh, the timing is now, or the timing is later. But just for this, uh, so the developer had, had some clear idea in mind. He had one, say, highlighted or, re or selected color in mind. It's maybe blue or maybe white. And he had a background color in mind. But if, you, if we only have two, uh, the only option that we have is that uh, there is some other elements on the page that will tell the user which, which is the, the right color. If we have three buttons, it would not be ambiguous. There would be two white and one blue, or two blue and one white. And so the different one would be the selected one. So we are playing with this difference. For showing which is the selected item, we are showing that item in a different way. But if, if we only have two, this difference trick uh, doesn't work because they are both different to each other, okay? So we cannot make our mind unless there is some uh, extra context uh, that gives us the rule, okay? That gives our mind the rule to decode that. Um, by the way, in these years of uh, uh, distance learning, uh, there is a, if you look at the, uh, at the mute buttons of your different uh, Zoom meet uh, teams and, and all the different, they take different approaches because again, they have this trouble of, of the two states. We have, you have one location, okay, that is trying to tell you the current state of, for example, the, the microphone. And uh, the same button can be used to change that state. So if the icon is uh, an open microphone, does it mean that if I click on the icon, uh, the, uh, the microphone is currently open, and if I click it, it will close? So the icon is showing the current status, or uh, the, the icon of, a, of an open microphone tells me that if I click that, I will open the microphone. So the icon will show me the effect of my action. So does it show the future state, the effect, the result of my action, or does it show the current status? Both are correct, of course. Usually, to this ambiguity, you have some extra visual indication, like, for example, the green a call that will you know, scramble and will show you that the mic is recording. So that is not ambiguous. It can only happen when the mic is recording. So the, you, uh, in this case, you have to add some extra information 
to help the user decode it, whether you are talking about a status, whether you're talking about an action, and so on. Um, inconsistencies. This uh, is a, um, a page from GitHub where you are setting the properties of a project. Okay, you see that the layout is very regular. All the items are in the same way, so there are different options, and these options are shown in, this, in the different ways. Each of them will have a checkbox, uh, will have a title, will have an explanation, and so on. But then we have a red part where the buttons are red, where there is a, a red instead of a gray frame. And uh, this is a, a deliberate inconsistency. We want to design this part in a different way because we want to, uh, say, give the information that this part is different somehow. How is it different? It's dangerous. It may be different because it's dangerous, because it's more important, because it's uh, you know, mandatory or what, whatever you want. But there is a difference, uh, so the user feels immediately that this is not the same as those. And the title makes it very clear why it is. Also the red color uh, in our culture means uh, uh, danger. So this simple rule, be consistent, uh, has a lot of uh, you know, implications. Uh, and uh, if you start looking at interfaces with these rules in mind, you will start to see how, where, and how and where the rule is applied and where it's not applied. Hmm? Uh, usability, universal usability. So uh, the system should be designed for different types of people. Okay? We are later on, in the, toward the end of the course, we'll talk about uh, uh, a bit about uh, users with disabilities uh, that need some special adaptation to the, um, to the interface, uh, so designing accessible interfaces. But uh, uh, even more sorry, simple variations uh, should be taken into account. Web versus mobile, or big screen versus small screen, and so on. So we have all the responsive design principles where you have the same content that should be presented in a different way according to the device. You may have uh, expert users and novices using the interface. Uh, you should not uh, overwhelm the novices with a lot of options because they will get lost, but you cannot uh, uh, you know, underestimate the experts and not giving them the uh, advanced uh, commands that they need. So there is uh, also the uh, concept of a progressive discovery. So let's show the easy options first uh, and find a way of opening more options. Mm. They are not shown by default because they will, be, they will overwhelm the novice users, but they are just one click away. Just a button you can more, you call more, you can you call advanced, you call optional features and so on that can be so, so basically, you, you, you are not planning for one interface. You are planning for a set of interfaces suitable for different contexts, depending on the device, on the level of expertise, on the, on the international variations in some times, which doesn't only mean translation or internationalization. It also means maybe changing the layout or the color coding according to the different background cultures, like left to right versus right to left, for example, uh, positioning. Um, feedback. Always give a feedback to any user action. For every user action, there should be an interface feedback. This is quite clear. So if you are clicking a button, the button should move in a way. In current interfaces, even if you are just hovering a button, the button in some way shows you that, that, okay, I'm ready to be clicked, I'm changing my color, just because you put uh, your mouse uh, on top of it. Hmm? So these are, the button example is trivial because all the operating systems already have that uh, built in. All the native widgets already, of course, implement these principles. But we should consider it also when we, we are designing our own 
uh, interface. Okay, so uh, if you are, if the user is selecting something or clicking on something or any action uh, should be, the, the user should never have the doubt, uh, did it get my action? Did it get my comment? Hmm? Um, I'm switching the light on here. So from this action, uh, the result uh, came after a couple of seconds. So in this couple of seconds, was I wa wondering whether it would I, I press the right button or I was fine knowing that the light will, would come out uh, after some time? Switching. Click. Okay, it's noisy. So I, I can hear that something happened there. So maybe the system is just slow to respond. But I got the feedback immediately, instantly. Okay, so I'm sure that the command went through and the system will respond. But if, if you had maybe instead of a normal clicking button, you know, uh, something very fancy with touch, a touch interface, so you go and touch it and it doesn't give you any real feedback, it could be, uh, then you sh will start wondering and try to press it twice or three times and so on. Unless maybe you have a visual feedback in this case. You touch there and so something changes. Maybe it's not the final effect, but at least a feedback that tells me I understood your command, I'm executing it. Hmm? Uh, of course, small actions require small and subtle feedbacks. More important actions, I completed your order, you are paying your money, require more visible uh, feedback that will stand out. Uh, maybe in some cases they will block you, there will be a model feedback. Uh, so uh, I wouldn't say when every time you, you type a letter into a field, uh, open a pop-up saying, okay, you typed F, oh, you typed R, oh, you typed, no, of course uh, it will be Unproportionate. If you're typing a field, just show me what I what I'm typing in real time. And if for some reason you cannot do that in real time because maybe you can go through, just show me a hourglass, a icon, or something that will tell me that okay, please wait a second or a split second, and you will see the result. Okay, so you must be proportionate, of course. And uh, we have, there's a lot of uh, visual clues huh, that will tell me whether something is active, is changing, uh, is, is in, it's in a final state uh, or is still in a, um, let's say, transient state uh, waiting to be updated. Hmm? So when you enter a command, probably the, the button or the text area that you use to enter the command will be, will disable immediately. So that's okay. Uh, I click the button, that button is not active anymore because it's carrying out the previous action. Then I will get the result. So the fact that this interface element reacted in some way is already telling me. So we only need the small clues, huh? but we need them. This is an example of feedback, which are very strong and visual, doesn't tell me really very much. Uh, these are kind of uh, error messages that we hope we never get because they will not tell us. For example, it's telling me there were problems in sending the message. And so, what should I do? There were problems, but at the end you delivered it? Or there were problems so it wasn't sent? Should I resend it? Minus one? Uh, there are examples of, of, of good uh, feedbacks. Hmm? For example, once I, w I was trying to install uh, Visual Studio Code, and I wanted to install it, uh, uh, you know that today a lot of programs just install in Windows, just install into the user's directory, okay? Which is something I hate, because they, they are hidden to the um, application directory inside the user's home, and okay. I wanted to install that uh, as a 
uh, at the machine level. So for all, all the users in the machine, it's only me, but at, le at least they will install that into the program files uh, uh, folder, right? So you normally, to do that, you have to uh, run the setup with the administrator as uh, it's really. It turns out that this version of the installer, Visual Code, doesn't support uh, installing system-wide. So I got this uh, message. This user installer is not meant to be run as administrator. If you would like to install Visual Code for all users, uh, then download another installer. Huh? This is the perfect error message. Tell me that something is not possible. What I understood what I wanted to do is telling me it can, it can be done with this, and it tells me the solution. And so I go and uh, execute the solution. It's not just giving something is wrong. What is wrong? Hmm? Uh, and of course, this kind of messages I remember from the first, uh, very, very first days of, of programming, we had this kind of uh, messages. Uh, this was the normal error message from, ba from basic application. Okay? So the users, when type, well, they made some, some typing, typing error, uh, for example, entering uh, uh, a string instead of a number, just got this uh, redo from start message directly from the system. It was some feedback, but actually uh, it, it didn't explain us. There was no, I say, real error handling at the time. At the time. Um, design dialogues to yield closure. What does it mean? Uh, we are not uh, filling forms uh, for fun. Okay, if we go through a step of forms or a step of screens where we select items, we enter information and so on, it's because we have some goals to reach. Okay, remember what we talked about, uh, when we talked about the task. The user has a goal in mind, uh, and so he will start executing a task make, made of different steps because he or she wants to reach their goal. So, uh, it's important that the user understands when the goal is reached, the closure of a sequence of steps. So the final point will actually, all is set. All the task, the task is, com I understand it's completed, and I'm getting the feedback, uh, and I'm sure that it reached uh, the goal that uh, I was initially uh, pursuing. So actually, we should have uh, the most important part is the, the end of a procedure, but also the beginning, so telling the user what is going to happen, what the user could expect, and uh, in the middle, show them the progress. So if you have more than one screen, give this information, and at the end, uh, provide feedback to satisfy the user. Uh, these are some very, um, nice side effect that if the user understands that, the, that his goal is reached, he will delete this task from his memory, okay? It, mm, it doesn't need to remember that something is midway been, been developed, so I still need to remember some details because I need to, you know, to continue tomorrow or continue later on. So I can wipe my memory and say, okay, this is done. Let's put it aside, go to the next, uh, next step or the next goal that they want to reach. Hmm? So in that way, uh, the user will always know where he is. Hmm? Uh, so there's a sequence of action. You have seen this, uh, you know, the water dispenser that we also have here at the Polytechnico. And uh, these are the instructions you know, for preparing your uh, uh, credit card uh, to pay for the, for the water. There is a procedure, but you need to read all of this, and basically it doesn't make sense. Hmm? Because you have a sequence of actions to, to perform that is not, uh, it, it, it will make sense if we think about uh, what this little embedded system is doing there. So there are actually, a two different readers, two different card readers, one for the barcode and one for the contactless, and one is just used for recognizing the card, 
and doesn't handle payment, and the other is only for handling payment but not for recognizing the card. And so they have, you play a, a, a strange trick with the card. This is frustrating. You need to read it, you need to, to read it twice because it, at the first it, you don't understand why you need to insert the card from the bottom and then pull it out and then uh, show it to the contactless reader. And so, so there's a sequence of actions that are not the normal action we, would, we are doing when we use the, our credit card in a shop. Hmm? And by the way, it's also written in a very verbose way, not very schematic and so on. So you always, at this stage, uh, you never know if you are done. You never know if you did everything correctly because the procedure is not clear and there is no closing point uh, that will tell you, okay, everything is okay. Uh, this is just a screen. Uh, one screenshot, simple, with a yes or no question. I'm missing something. Uh, if I click on yes or no, is this selection already sent to the system? Or I'm missing some okay or some meet or button somewhere that will tell me, okay, I click on yes and then submit. Or next if I'm part of a sequence of steps. So if I had a button like that, uh, it would be very clear that I need to select my option and then confirm it with the button. Otherwise, I don't know whether this, okay, I'm selecting yes and how do I confirm it? Maybe it already confirms itself, but it's not common practice to have a radio button behave like this. If I have two or three radio, uh, options on the same page, it will be clear that I need to select all the options and then confirm. Because I have many questions on the same page. But if I only have one question, does it confirm itself? Or does it need some extra confirmation that I'm not finding in this page? What would I do here? I would have two buttons instead of two radio buttons. So a button can only be clicked or not. I'm clicking here or I'm clicking there. So it's a one step action. A radio button is a two step action. First select, then confirm. Okay? And so the user, once he selected one of these items, doesn't know whether his choice has been recorded by the system. It also gives me the impression that they can select once and then change my mind because both are visible and usually red buttons uh, work in this way. Hmm? Preventing errors. Uh, first of all, the best uh, prevention is uh, avoidance. If possible, create the interface so that the user cannot make mistakes. Uh, disable all the menu items, all the buttons, all the elements that are not meaningful in this moment. So if I not click it, uh, I will not click it by mistake. So if you know that a given action doesn't make sense at this stage, so for example, submitting a form when some mandatory data is missing. It's very stupid to let the user, even, even evil, to let the user click on submit just to tell them, uh, or you are missing some information. The submit button should not be clickable until all the information is there. Of course, you must also let the user understand why this button is not clickable. So maybe besides the button, you write the, the reason. You're still missing this information. And also in, a, in every form element, uh, you're showing maybe a red border to show, okay, there's something wrong here. So the user can only ask for actions that are meaningful and correct. Um, for example, if you are asking for a number, don't let the user enter some letters and then tell them, uh, okay, this is wrong. Okay, you can filter wrong characters beforehand. You can have a, 
um, a list of possibilities to select from and so on hmm? and this is for preventing errors uh, uh, and also in a way if something goes wrong because you we really cannot prevent everything give uh, easy way to understand uh, how to recover from some errors okay um, I don't remember whether it was Gmail or some other program where when you sent an email you had a couple of seconds to block the sending because usually you realize you, you forgot the attachment or you send email uh, okay with the wrong subjects uh, just just immediately after you click on send okay so that uh, program gave you a couple of uh, seconds to say okay if you want to cancel this uh, this action click here to undo course it only lasted a couple of seconds because then the, the, the message has to go okay. but at least you know you have a, a, a window of opportunity to correct an error that would be let's say unrecoverable usually in other cases um, so this this was for let's say dangerous action like sending an email because when it's sent you can you lost any control over it if uh, the information stays within the system we should always be able to go back and change what we did. Hmm? You don't know how many students uh, are writing us to say, oh, yesterday I enrolled, they closed my Carico Didattico. I just submitted it, uh, and today I thought they could change it, whether I can change it because I changed my mind. Okay. So this is also a dangerous situation because in some cases there are some deadlines. You are submitting official documents. So you cannot change them so easily. Hmm? Uh, but it's, it's in, the, in the mindset of the users that when I, I'm saving something, I should be able to go back and modify it. Hmm? In some cases, let's say, formally is not possible. But and uh, we should. As much as possible, user errors should not be unrecordable from the application point of view. Mm -hmm. So if you are changing something, you can always, you should be able to, to go back in some way. No? Um, this is an example of a form that does everything uh, to, to induce errors instead of uh, uh, preventing them. A, a normal login uh, form, okay. Uh, Warning, if the username is a codice fiscale, you need to insert that with the capital letters. What, what is trying to tell me? It's for, uh, so if the username is a codice fiscale. So it may be a codice fiscale or maybe something else. But if the login name is of different types, I would prefer probably two different login windows. Do you want to log with your Codice Fiscale or do you want to log with your email, for example? I don't know what is the alternative. It's, there's an if. And the execution of this if is left, le left to the user. It's the user who must implement part of the, of the website logic in this case. It's like the programmer was too lazy to put an if in his code and it's tried to put a NIF into the user's code. Hmm? Not nice. And if it is a policy fiscal, you must enter it in capital letters. Oh, wait. We found a computer with, which is not able to convert a string into capital letters by itself. Why should I need to do that? It's an easy enough function to be done by the computer itself. By the way, if the alternative here would be an email address, we know that by definition email address are not case sensitive. So mm, the program could, any, could convert to capital letters anyway, every kind of input. If there are some login names which are case sensitive, well, then we are in a dangerous position here because there will be some, if some in some time, sometimes it should be all capital, sometimes it uh, can be mixed case and the case will be significant. But what happens if I have a user that creates a login name that looks like a codice fiscale, but it's not? 
So we are op this small inconsistency opens a, a lot of questions about uh, about the design basically of the system. So if you have different login spaces, use different login forms and let the user choose before. So then you can validate and help the user in formatting and checking the right uh, format. Hmm? Did you forget the password? Click here. Okay. And if you are a health professional, register. So what? Again, what I try to do. Uh, if I am a health professional, I should register. But if I already registered, so can I log in if I am a health professional that I was, I, I, um, where I already was registered? Or do I need to register any time, every time? What, what, what are you trying to tell me? Is this interface uh, suitable for health professionals and other people? Or only for health professionals? So if it's only for a professional, why do we ask this question? Are you a professional? If you're not registered, you should register. If it's also for other people, not only a professional, how could they register? Of course, I don't have any answers to any of these questions. Hmm? I can only think all the good I can to the developers that did this. Um, linked to the errors, the error corrections are the reversal of actions. Well, I may want to reverse an action even if I didn't make an error, but just because I changed my mind. And so I did something, I, okay, I need to correct it, I thought it better, and they want to change it. So, uh, having the possibility or the knowledge that I can change the information I gave, I can undo the action I did, puts the user in a much more comfortable situation. Just imagine if tomorrow all the control Z in all the programs that you're using for undoing don't work anymore. Okay, so you're writing, you're typing one page of code, by accident you delete 20 lines just because you slipped on your keyboard, but you cannot undo. Huh? That would create a very different mindset in your typing. You will, it would uh, invalid or uh, you would not want uh, the auto-saving features. Uh, today's a lot of environments auto -save the, automatically save the file. Google Drive in first. There's no save function. There's no save and we are, we, we are happy with that because it protects us and if we make some mistakes, we always have the undo or the history that are ways of going back to previous situation to change the last action or the one of the last actions we did. So these mechanisms let us, let's say, encourage us to try and write because we know we can always get, get, uh, go back. We, can, we are encouraged to explore, to try different commands. Okay, let's try to format this. In the worst case, control Z, I go back the previous situation. I don't risk of getting, maybe I'm experimenting with different fonts or with different colors in my slide. Uh, if I mess it up, I can always go back to the previous version. Hmm? Without the possibility of going back and changing my mind, uh, I would not uh, be so open to exploration of the interface of the comments and so on. Hmm? And of course, when we are talking about uh, going back, it may be going back to or undoing the last action or the last task or a complete uh, group of actions. There may be different levels of granularity. So I have a form on, on a split of multiple pages, I will go back to the previous page. Or I submitted some information, I have an edit button to go back and bring it back uh, what I wrote and correct it and save it again. 
but no information should be entered in a final way, final and not modifiable way. Uh, this quite, uh, it doesn't seem, no, in general, these principles are not, they look like trivial in some time. No? They're not very complex uh, items or triple integrals to do. They look trivial, they look normal, because we are used to use a lot of applications that really implement them. So we expect them to be respected. We expect to be able to correct what we brought. We expect to be able to be told if we made an error. Okay? But it's not automatic. Somebody programmed that. Somebody thought of that. And we don't see all that because uh, it helps our, you know, we are in the flow. We are just executing the task uh, in, in a way where there are no surprises where there are good safeguards for our errors. So the less we notice the interface, the better it's designed. And the better it implements everything the user expects to do. When we notice an interface, uh, it's because there's something, it doesn't follow the normal flow, hmm? the normal expectation. Keep users in control. Uh, the interface should always respond to user actions. Even if the system is busy, you should be able to, to do that uh, or to accept some user command, uh, don't block uh, everything. And of course, it's uh, complex no? because then you have to develop uh, every application is in an asynchronous way when you are the user interface task uh, separate from the, the, ex the command execution task and should, they should synchronize. And we all know what, how painful it is uh, to work with the synchronous uh, parts of an application. But it's the only way that the user will feel in control. If this interface is not blocked. Or, or maybe there's an, a screen that is telling the user, please wait a couple of minutes. But on that screen, we have a cancel button. So that if the user doesn't want, it can, it has an escape um, uh, action. Hmm? Uh, as much as possible, don't put the user through boring set uh, of tasks. Okay, now we have to fill the next 17 screens uh, with a lot of information. No, I'm not doing that. No, try to keep uh, data entry or boring tasks uh, to a minimum. We are not forcing the user to do some work for us. We are helping the user to reach their goals. So, of course, we need some information for helping them, but let's keep that to a minimum. And then, of course, giving the possibility of, 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 of giving more, okay, extra information, but should not be mandatory. The procedure should be lean, short, as much as possible. Avoid surprises cha or changes in familiar behaviors. So, like the radio button that behaves like a, a submit button. So we are using a widget in a way that the user doesn't expect. We are breaking a lot of rules, a lot of, of uh, interface guidelines rules. Always provide the undo actions or the cancel and confirm action and so on. Hmm? Uh, so that the user always knows where the, what the system is doing and whether the action is completed or not. Uh, there are a lot of uh, ex exceptions to this. No? For example, we have uh, this is a part of one question that we, we received. Uh, which problems did you have in uh, in, the, in in the exams? And the, well, the first one answer, answer was I didn't have any problem. So just the first answer is inconsistent with the question because the question asks which problem. So if I'm asking which problems, the assumption is that there were some problems. And the answer cannot be, I didn't have any. Hmm? No is not an answer to which. But anyway, okay, it's, just, it, it's sloppy writing. But then when once I select, I didn't have any problem, I can also select uh, some of the problem at the same time. Does it make sense? No. If I say no, I didn't have any problem, I should not be able to select any of the other items. 
that describe possible problems. So this is not helping me at all in explaining my idea, my position. Because the representation of the answers doesn't fit any clean, let's say, mental model. Probably I could have two different questions. Did you have any problem, yes or no? And if yes, then we have an extra question, which one? That will be clear. And if, if the answer is no, the second question doesn't need to be displayed. So one less step for the normal case, for example. Um, we are performing a task jointly with the users. So the system, while, for example, imagine entering some information, the system is gathering information about the user and the system is remembering what the user is entering, okay? It's remembering the state of interaction. But also the user, the user is remembering the state of interaction. Because if we have three steps, uh, the user should remember that we are in step one or two or three. So uh, in, in their mind, their short-term memory, the user should remember something which is relevant to the current interaction. So the rule here is keep this information to a minimum. Uh, ideally, show on the screen all the information the user needs to understand the current status of interaction. Um, for example, if I enter my you need to imagine you want to uh, enroll to a, um, an exam okay so and you have a first screen where you select the exam and the second screen where you select the date maybe there are different possible dates the second screen should show the name of the of the course that you selected in the first screen of course you know which one was you just selected it you remember it in the next screen. But if you show it there, you are giving more context to the second screen, to the second choice. You can show, the user can feel or can check whether the right course has been selected because maybe the user in the first screen clicked on the, on the wrong course. And so he's, he's enrolling to the wrong course. And if you show that, the user doesn't have to remember, the user can check the correctness of the data they enter so they are more sure they can go back if they want to change their mind and so on so we don't need the user in this case to remember what they did in the previous screen or just imagine that the user after clicking on the previous screen just gets a phone call it will forget what he just did because there was a change of context in his mind and so on so it goes it goes back to one screen that will ask him select a date for what sorry I need to go back or to restart, okay? So the user, normally, the rule says that the people can remember up to seven plus or minus two items of information in their mind, their short-term memory. Okay, short-term means less than one, one minute. Um, so we cannot, uh, usually, hmm, some people are better than others. Women are better than men, in remem I remember in this case. Uh, but let's take the conservative way, five, five items. I, you just should not need to remember more than five items. One item which would be what I'm trying to do. So we have four left uh, of information that we can expect the user to remember from the previous steps in the task, and we don't need to repeat them. Uh, information that I enter on a screen should not be needed in the next screen. So the user should not have to remember what he entered before. This means that the key information should be repeated, and in any case, at the end, you should have a, uh, a summary of all the information you enter. So before finalizing, okay, we say, okay, we, we collected the information in three different steps. Uh, we have finished. Uh, 
have a look at the summary of what you entered and then confirm. So that if you didn't remember what you entered in the first screen, you had the choice of checking it. Then people don't read it anyway, they click on OK, and then they say, oh no, it was wrong. And so they need to go back. Um, OK, if possible, this depends on the interface, don't split the procedure in different steps just for the sake of for graphical design or whatever. So if you can ask three questions in the same page, it's better than having three separate pages. Of course, if these questions are related to each other. Um, of course, if, and if you are on a small form device, then you maybe need to split it in different pages. By splitting into different pages, in many cases, it requires the user to remember something, uh, remember the context of, of the previous information. Uh, I was always puzzled with this choice that a lot of websites are doing right now. Why should we enter our email in one screen and the password in the second one? Are we, did we become so stupid <laughs> that we cannot enter two, two information in the same page? Of course, I entered the uh, email in the first screen, and why in the second screen I'm being asked uh, to the password, I have a reminder of what I entered in the first one. And if something, if, I, if this is what is the wrong one, I can always go back, open here, and change it. So going back there is possible. Okay? So. I'm not forced to remember what I wrote or because it's shown right here. But why couldn't the password field just be on the first screen in the first place? Uh, they, there may be different uh, explanations to this. One is that uh, uh, the type of validation depends on the type of user. So if you have a normal user, you have to enter a password. If you have a double, let's say, what's it called, the two-factor authentication, you will get the authentication screen where you have to enter the code. Uh, if you have, a, if you are, a, for example, um, an enterprise customer, you will go to the enterprise authentication page. So, for example, the Google applications. The, the, for education that Polytechnic has, if I enter the Polytechnic address, not the personal one, it will lead me to the Polytechnic uh, login page, and then go there. So the way in which uh, the way in which the second factor, so the password, is uh, gathered, is different uh, according to the username, and so they decided to split it. So instead of, uh, remember the, the form that we showed before, if you have the Codice Fiscale, they let, in this case, they let you enter your, your email, and then, analyzing that, they decide how to proceed, or what kind of extra information to ask. But from the usability point of view, I don't like it. It's more complex than it should be. It takes two steps when only one would have been enough. Uh, but in general, all the world of password and notification is closed. So there is no good solution, and no usable, no, uh, sorry, no good usability for this. In fact, a lot of companies are trying to tell you that passwords are, are disappearing. Okay, they're trying to use different forms of authentication, like basically biometrics, or remembering something to your browser so that next time you go there, you don't have to log in again. But at the same time, they are making the login process more complex. Okay, because when you enter the password on a new device, then you will get uh, uh, an email for confirmation and on the device that you left at home in your drawer. And uh, so you have to call your friend, please go to my device and tap on yes. And uh, a lot of complexity is there. Hmm? Um, as a general rule, 
users should never type anything they could select so if I uh, asking what what country are you from instead of typing the country it's better to have a list of those countries basically since the list is long I would have some auto completion so I start typing it first letters and they have, have a short list uh, of countries to select from it's something that we see every day we expect to, do, to have that instead of typing uh, then I don't know typing uh, Italy I should do should I type it in English or should I type the Italian form of the name of the country so if I have a list I just have to select to, to pick the right one from the list and there's no space for error and then <laughs> there is some this is again from Politecnico uh, some creative way of making the lists so the list is very very long so it will scroll uh, screens and screens with the different scores that you got in your certificate uh, except that they are not in order 175 76 77 89 60 61 62 63 because they change the natural ordering of the numbers and be between 179 and 160 that are not consecutive numbers by the way they are putting some before 2015 or before 2015 with a score higher than 162 and uh, so this is it's totally uh, unusable you are never sure you selected the right one okay so this there are two questions here one is uh, did you get it before or after 2015 and what score did you get I can type 160 with my finger I don't need to be able to select it or if you want to select a number put a, a control for entering numbers not just a long list where I have to to seek for okay the BC that is is it relevant no it's a consequence of the number so let me enter the number and show me okay this corresponds to a B so I have a double check of the correctness of the number hmm? so always let the user choose from a list uh, when you have the all the options uh, except when it's more natural to enter a, a number rather than selecting from from a list of numbers okay we, we don't expect uh, selection boxes to have to be a list of numbers um, okay we see that these these are the eight main principles okay we can recognize them in many places what I want you to do is to wire your brain so that you become triggered every time you see something wrong in any website you see uh, we already did that uh, in the you know remember in the first week we asked you to give some ideas for a hall of fame or a wall of shame okay in, in website and you did that with your without knowing anything about human, human computer interaction just with your previous experience okay now we are starting to see some practical rules uh, and maybe you understand that you made those choices of the hall of shame especially because uh, there was some violation of some of these principles so we will go back uh, and uh, in one of the next weeks uh, after we also see the heuristics and check some of your submissions and to evaluate them with all we know now uh, so we we are able not just to say this website is terrible but we should be able this website is terrible because of these reasons because it violates this set of rules uh, rule, rules and we know how to fix it we know what we should have done instead hmm? so we are turning say intuition which is always arguable I think this website is terrible no I think not I like it and then the discussion stops there it doesn't go anywhere instead if we say okay this website has a problem and there's an issue because the, in this screen we are violating the consistency principle then we can start from there to correct the error because at that point the error will be undeniable in a way it's always difficult to speak with some developers because you are you know um, speaking badly or their children so they always take it personally 
Uh, okay, there are other uh, lists of principles, like, for example, this one from, from Banyan that talks about uh, visibility, consistency, familiarity, and affordance. So you see that uh, other authors uh, created lists of device uh, of, um, of principles which are similar. Uh, navig sorry, navigation, control, feedback, and so on. Uh, so they are basically different sets of lists, uh, lists uh, sorry, uh, sorry, of rules uh, that more or less uh, uh, are telling the same things. I, I only spend a minute uh, or two to explain one concept that was not in the eight list and uh, the list of eight basic principles, which is affordance. The concept of affordance starts in the, in the physical world where the shape of an object determines the way in which you can use that object. So this one has a shape that clearly demands for grasping it. Okay, this clip is something whose shape can only you know, be attached somewhere. So the, we have a button here, and the button can be it's a, a slider button. So you cannot press it, you can only slide it. It's constrained, you cannot do anything else with that. Okay, a lot of physical objects uh, are designed, the ones that are well designed, can only be used in a way, okay? So if you have a door handle, you, you can grab it. And if the handle is vertical, you, you know you can pull it. If the handle is horizontal, probably you can rotate it if the design is good, okay? And uh, so the same is for interface. This is an example of a waste collection, collecting uh, uh, station where uh, you have different shapes uh, for, sorry, the picture is not good, but no, sorry, the, the visibility is not good, but in the PDF uh, should be clearer. Um, the shape uh, of the holes uh, remember the shape of the objects you need to put there. So you have batteries uh, with round holes. You have CDs or DVDs, so we always have CDs to throw away, I don't know. But it's a, just a narrow uh, line. Hmm? Uh, so to help people throw their right uh, um, trash into the right place. Uh, of course, uh, this is never enough because some person put a neon tube uh, into the um, print cartridge uh, waste uh, position, hmm? the toner position. Okay. Uh, we don't have time, but uh, you all went through this screen. Uh, it was when you enrolled in the in the Politecnico, hmm? the first year, and there was this screen. Maybe we can. Uh, discuss it uh, in one of the next times we, while doing the uh, risk evaluation. Try to think about how many principles are violated by the screen. Okay, we have two radio buttons: confirm, go back, okay, and forward. So it all starts with uh, what is the difference with, between confirm and forward, and it goes down from there. Okay, so if you remember what it did, uh, you already know the answer. What is the difference between confirmation and go forward? And if you don't, probably you will never, you will never be able to guess what happened. Hmm? I will tell you next time. Okay, so right now we can, it's 10 o'clock. We can go to the lab, uh, to the, of the first uh, round.